So good day, my name is Glenn Zimmerman and I'm the Director of Corporate Communications and Marketing here at Podium Data, based in Boston. Welcome. Uh, today I've got a gentleman named Chris Geiger joining me. Chris is an ideas consultant, specifically for sales, and he does a lot of work for Podium and we're glad he's here today. Thanks for joining us, Chris. I appreciate it very much, sir. So Chris is going to talk a little bit about something he's very passionate about. Uh, storytelling, as a matter of fact. This is probably one of our first episodes around the storytelling series. And we're leading off with Chris because he's one of our great storytellers. One of the things that he's passionate about is taking the complexities of technology and then uh, telling it in a way that makes it more consumable for the folks that we're trying to reach and influence, be it a technical audience member or, or a business analyst or sometimes it's part of a data delivery team or, or a CTO. So on these different levels, we speak with different voices, trying to help businesses get bigger gains from their big data and also remove the complexities of their ecosystem, be it on-prem, cloud, or a combination of both. Chris, before we get started with data is oxygen, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I started off my career with a company called Epsilon, which was the leading company in the field of customer relationship marketing and databases and analytics. And along the way, I spent 17 years there and I was I had a great, great honor and a privilege to be able to visit with many of the great companies across the United States and internationally, um, almost like a butterfly. And, and what that allowed me to do was to start to see patterns of how companies were dealing with shifts in, in the whole world of data and the whole world of of, um, of analytics and the use of those analytics. In fact, Epsilon invented the loyalty programs with American Airlines. So if you think about what loyalty programs are, and they are really nothing other than um, service supported by data. So I was very honored to do that. I started a company after that with a, one of the gentlemen who actually founded Podium called Tesser Enterprise Systems. And I'm gonna talk about it later on today about Amazon, but we actually built out Amazon's first analytic data warehouse. And um, I think both Paul and I rue the day we took money instead of stock, but that's another matter. <laughs> so um, yes, I've been very, very interested in this whole field of data. And, and the reason is, is because uh, it is becoming the speed and rapidity, uh, uh, the rapid high powered fire of, of, of data coming at us today is growing exponentially. It's growing much faster than Moore's law. So there used to be 1,500 data sources across the globe. There are now 5,000 data sources every month coming on stream, brand new. And the volume of data, and you can all know this, is, is, is growing so exponentially as well that simply the old ways of looking at how to handle data and how to handle that to deliver it to businesses so they can make decisions with it it just doesn't work anymore. And so I'm a storyteller, I'm not a technology person, and so part of my job is to change the conversation of, I wanna evaluate this technology for six months to there's a different way to look at this. And if you're not looking at it that way, the, you are going to be in big trouble. So the first slide I have up is, a, is the data is oxygen, and I put up the top 10 companies in the United States. Those 10 companies, well, LinkedIn is now owned by Microsoft and, and the like, but those 10 companies have over $3 trillion of market cap. The, the five people who run those, including Warren Buffett, have 50% of all the money in the United States. That's remarkable. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And what the common thing about every one of those companies is that the head person is a data person. And their AI teams, which is a new popular term, sit right next to the chairman and the presidents of those companies. They have data in their DNA. And if you don't have data in your DNA and you're in a data-driven economy, you've got to rethink the whole concept of how my organization can, can adapt. We're going to talk about cases for each one of these. But The Economist about six months called data is oil for the new economy. And there's a guy named Peter Diamandis. He was the gentleman who started the X Prize, and uh, if you don't know him, you should look him up. He's got a thing called Abundance. He's recently come out with a bunch of predictions, and the reason I don't think data is really oil is because within 15 years, 100% of our energy is going to come from renewable sources. But we haven't replaced oxygen yet. 
and oxygen is much bigger than oil. Well, it's interesting, too, because if, if you read Doug Laney of Gartner's book, uh, Infonomics, he said that the data is the new oil is dated, uh, and that oil is actually something that burns up and that it's gone. Right. Uh, whereas oxygen is ever expanding. It's ever expanding and renewable. It's, it's really interesting. So I, I put the slide up and it shows the new Amazon Go store. And one of the most interesting things I find out about Amazon Go is not necessarily that, uh, that Bezos put up one or two stores. That's not what's really interesting about it. What's interesting about it is that he bought uh, Whole Foods. And for years, a lot of companies have tried to figure out how the home delivery is working, how to make the self-service, how to put good economics into the food business. Bezos, with this experimentation, has a completely self-serve, autonomous, people-less grocery store. Yes, it's small, but if you take a look at what he's doing, he's building out the data so that he can extend that data across all of the Whole Foods marketplace. And I, I say that only, and it's, it's very popular to say, oh, Amazon, Amazon. But what they're doing is a very interesting, interesting, uh, interesting thing. Data is at the core of their business. It's like a friend of mine that used to say, if L.L. Bean's buildings burnt down next week, they'd still have 20 million customer records. Their business would continue. Amazon is the same way. They are absolutely data-driven business on everything they do. So let's take a look at the financial services world. I've had the privilege in the last um, uh, several months here to talk with 15 major financial services organizations, the biggest of the big. And on a consistent basis, every one of them is talking about moving all of their data to the cloud, specifically AWS and S3. So within five years, Amazon's going to be the largest financial services technical infrastructure company on the planet. They are going to have all of the data, all the services, all the ancillary services. They can get the payments, credit card processing. They, and if I were a bank, I would be, I would be pretty nervous about that. But that's just an idea in the financial services business. The new fintech business, you read all about it. There's Betterment, Wealthfront, these are, and the alternative B2B lending. Uh, those can't scale. There's two or 300 of these alternative B2B payday loan advanced forward and business to business. Well, Amazon decided to get into that business and they launched last year and sent, gave out $1 billion in the first 12 months. Everybody else, think about going to a bank. So you go to a bank, you're a small business, and I want to get a loan. Link the application process, all the due diligence. Amazon, there's no application process. Amazon uses their analytics to invite you. Glenn, I, so your business is doing X. I'd like to loan you $250,000 at X percent. Completely different process. And, it's, and they have, in their Amazon marketplace, they have data on millions and millions of businesses. And that's a completely different way to look at that. Let's translate that to the insurance business. I don't know if you've heard of this company called Lemonade. I'd invite any one of you to go onto your website, look up Lemonade. It just came out of the blue. What Lemonade decided to do is use machine learning and AI to drive the entire rental insurance business in New York City. Now, the top five have been around for five decades. And let's call, let's just say the top five have 100% market share. Um, what they did is it takes 90 seconds to be approved for your rental insurance. It takes three minutes to get paid if you have a loss. There is no deductible, no rate hikes. So you can lose a bike or a pair of flip flops, take the picture, send it to them. Artificial intelligence says, yeah, these guys are real or not real. Banks, the money's deposited to your bank account. Think about that compared to going to Allstate and saying, I'd like to get renter's insurance. A whole application process, we're going to do a credit check, all that baloney. So, interestingly enough, 1.6% share makes you a top 10 insurer in the United States. In the first couple of months of Lemonade launching New York City, they took 1%. So what you say? After six months, it was 4.6%. That's the existing share. And now, after the first year, maybe it's a year and a half, they are capturing 20% of all first-time renters. In That's the eating someone else's lunch. Absolutely, 27%. Not new market. It's a brand new market, and, and oh, by the way, they, new just, market shares, what I meant. they just launched homeowners insurance. And you don't think they're going to get into all the rest of insurances? 
Um, and and then another interesting thing, you can go on to all the blogs that, that, that these guys write up. Um, women who traditionally don't buy renters insurance are coming out in droves. So they have completely changed out the renters insurance market, clearly $237 or $300 low end. But the big insurance companies, if they're not nervous about that, I can't tell you. So let's just talk about one example of how a big insurance company did get nervous. Simply Business in London. They launched in 2000, I think it's 2005. So full disclosure, as a storyteller, most of the facts can be pretty, pretty accurate, but if you, if you do your research, you'll be able to pick them apart. That's not the point. The point is, is that they launched in London delivering to micro businesses and small businesses. It takes minutes to apply and be approved. They ginned up 425,000 customers in several years and Travelers just bought them for $490 million. It's a fintech company because Travelers could not figure out how to sell small business insurance in London. Think about that, out of the blue. Speaking of Travelers, a good friend of mine is, I don't want to, I can't officially say she's the chief innovation officer, but that's clearly how she's acting. So what Travelers is doing, and there's another company called Swiss RE, these are two of the largest established companies, both internationally and nationally, they're starting to sponsor local innovation. And they've got a little local lab down there, and they're putting startups in the lab, and they're set up approved data sets so that they can bring in new technologies and try, buy, or dump. And they can do that. So if you think about how long would it take Travelers Insurance or any major company to onboard a new technology, one or two years? I'm going to come back to that at the end of my discussion. And Swiss RE, which is the... Uh, arguably one of the largest global reinsurers, they set up a digital innovation team right inside MIT's innovation district, right inside the building. And that, their whole goal is every month or quarter, they uncover new technologies and they go to Armand and they present to the business units all across the globe for the same thing, try, buy, or dump. And a dump is a harsh word, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But it's not going to spend two years figuring that out. We're going to spend three months because I've got to move on to the next one. AIG is actually taking it one step further. They actually have an investment fund. So if they see a promising new technology, so they can invest in it. So I, I take a look at that and I say, wow, in the financial services and insurance business, you've got competitors that are coming out that have DNA at from the top down, completely reinvented it in a digital economy, peopleless. And it's going to completely transform, you know, uh, these big, big companies. And if you think about that, it's going to happen to your business as well. We, automotive, we can go down the line. Uh, I, I work with another client in New York City. And this is fascinating to me because eBay is on my list up here. Went down to New York City to see this startup. I get there. It's on 6th Avenue. I walk up the stairs. And I couldn't find them anywhere. It turns out in New York City, eBay has devoted an entire half of the floor to put 10 startup companies in residence. And it's just to keep their employees thinking about the new stuff that's coming out so that eBay doesn't fall behind. I thought it was fascinating. Radical. It completely rent free. Think I'm a startup. That's crazy. I get, that's I get to New York City, you know, it's like $500. Who knows what it is? Sure. But it's, 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 it's fascinating. So I, my prediction right now is that the next big job coming out is going to be the chief innovation officer. And there's going to be one in every single solitary company. And that person's job is to be, is to source out with their team new technologies and get them in. And I'm going to talk about that later. So what you've said is between Amazon, Lemonade, Simply Business, businesses that win at data, win. Uh, yes, and that's they, what's going to make that title so popular. That's, it's absolutely. Businesses that win at data are, will have a better chance of me. You can always poorly execute, but yes. <laughs> uh, so I take a look at the Airbnb. I'm going to London. I've got an Airbnb in London. Staying in the, oh, I, I, I forget what section of London we're staying in. And they, not only has Airbnb totally transformed the city housing economics, right? They, they've transformed the hotel industry, but now they're getting into curated experiences. So I, I got 15 messages from Airbnb saying, oh, Chris, we noticed you're staying here in London. You know, there's a tour guide who can take you to the funky art places. There's another tour guide you can spend a half day and take you to one of the museums you like, and you can spend some extra. So they're getting to the curated experiences. 
And, and you go, wow. And that's a data-driven company. It's nothing other than data. They don't own one property. Well, maybe they will. Um, Uber. Everyone knows all about Uber. Uber. You know, all the goods and the bads. But I don't know if anybody knows about Uber Movement. Uber Movement. They've annotized 2 billion rides, and they're selling it, selling it to cities worldwide for all things about vehicle traffic congestions, variable cost structures for fees. So I'm the guy, Uber, has all the data on all the cars in your city. I know where everybody is. I can see all the rides. If you want to charge five bucks to come at this time at Yano, because that's the, you have the data for the first time to make real decisions. And it's something completely different than ride sharing. This is about a pure, absolute data play. And if you think about traffic and cars and congestion, it's a, it's a complete data play as a byproduct of ride sharing. Um, and oh, by the way, they're killing parking in valets. It's another thing. Um, I, it's a great privilege for me to uh, be a mentor at the Harvard Business School iLabs. And um, there's a couple interesting stories here. I'm not gonna talk about the specific themes, but Here's what I find interesting. Now, the Harvard Business School, as only Harvard is wont to do, and Stanford and MIT have done the same thing, as well as many great universities and colleges, um, decided, as probably because Zuckerberg <laughs> and Gates left, um, to open up an innovation lab. And they have three labs. They have an innovation lab where any team from across Harvard, led by Harvard, um, supported by MIT and other schools in the area, they have a launch lab once they get funding and they can go to a launch lab, and then they have a wet lab for, for wet sciences. And, they, and the ecosystem they put around this, you've got, the, you've got free storage, free software, free attorneys, you've got venture capital school. But here's what I found interesting. In the winter section of the 75 teams that were accepted, 13 of them were pure fintech companies. Pure digital fintech companies. And that's just at Harvard. I don't know how many are coming out of MIT. Who knows about Stanford? We're a little bit biased on the coast here. Right, so, right. you know, you've got New York and you've got, you know, in the center, in, in Austin. Think about that. So 20% of the companies are pure fintech companies. In the latest cohort, the spring session, 22 of the 73 were healthcare fintech startups. So if you're in the healthcare business and you've got this massive claims processing going on, people-based. You've got this whole infrastructure and all of the new companies coming out are gonna go after all the high margin stuff. Interesting. Yeah, it is. There was this, one of the interesting applications was I, I, I've taken 20 million different, uh, 20 million different um, diseases and outcomes, loaded them in, then I went and crowdsourced who the best doctors were for that. Not from the doctors, not from the rating bureaus. I crowdsourced from the people who work with the doctors. And now I can go to you, Mr. Silverman, and say, Glenn, based on this problem you've got, here are the three best doctors around you ought to go talk to. Completely takes out the hospital, completely takes out the network, and it's an app. And you go, whoa. So, and then you go back to Amazon again, and we've all read about how Amazon, you know, and Morgan Stanley and Warren Buffett teaming up. And it would be interesting to see how that plays out. So that's in healthcare. I'd be very nervous, and I've been privileged again to talk to two big, really healthcare companies, and they are beside themselves on data. Because yeah. um, what they don't want to be left with is the expensive people-based claims processing mm. um, and member benefits. So, perpetual evolution and embracing disruptive technology doesn't always make business leaders popular. Nope. So. I mean, it makes them popular with us because we're in the business of fixing things for them yes, and absolutely. making that seamless. So help me kind of sew it up. So how, how Podium comes in and, and helps, you know, instill and join forward thinking professionals who want to challenge the norm because we did in building the, the data marketplace. So kind of help me connect those dots because you can't really connect all the dots with big data unless you have all the dots? Yeah, um, I, I, end with, I end with one little story and then I'm gonna come back to Lemonade and I'm gonna show you how we can help you with that. So uh, one of our major communications companies, the head of IT described this need as an automated self-service data grocery store. So he's thinking about Amazon. And once he made that shift, I wanna have a data marketplace, a data grocery store, 
it, it became clearly evident that, that Podium, given their, 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 the platform that they've built from an end-to-end -end data management platform within, within the quote-unquote data lake business, although we call it a data marketplace, has the ability to build a curated, cataloged, self-serve, people-less, if you will, uh, data marketplace. So that's, that's what we saw. So all of these issues that I talked about are core to what we saw. And the other way we solve it, and let's go back to lemonade. So if a big, uh, big financial services company, we're dealing with two right now, takes one to two years to evaluate, checklist, brutal size, and try to slow down, and in that same year, Amazon uh, lemonade took 27% of new business, there's got to be a new way to compete. You've got to think about how to onboard technologies. You've got to think about data differently. You've got to think about how to curate that data and get it into the hands of decision makers, not in months, but in minutes. Because anything less, it, you're falling behind and the data volumes are going. So that's, a, that's the core issue Podium solves. We have the ability to get it to your users in minutes in a curated, governed, proper fashion. And we have the ability to manage it end to end so you have a lineage of it. The other way we are helping companies is to take a whole different approach of, uh, of competition. And the old way of competition is called proof of concept. Let me take your technology and let's spend 18 months doing a proof of concept. That's useless. It's the, let's go back to travelers, try, buy, or don't. And so the new rule of competition is start now, experiment, learn and adapt. Pilot to production in 30 to 90 days with no more checklists. It either works or it doesn't. I'm either 80% there or not. If I'm 80% there, let's, let's move forward, keep on going. And the real key is that if you don't do it this way, the data growth will outpace your people-driven processes. So in the year that you spend evaluating a podium-like technology, which you'd have to cobble together 15 different software products to even equal what podium is, is doing, in that year, your data volume will have tripled and you have a people-based business. So the software technologies he's using will be absolutely obsolete or require more people. And that's the one thing that companies are sadly, in many cases, are, are really starting to take a hard, close look at. I cannot hire any more people. Either I can't find them or the ones I can find are so expensive or in the case of in, in robotics as an example, I just don't need them. And so there is some, there is some, uh, I've got mixed feelings in some of that, to be, to be honest with you. I, it's not something I can change. But I do think that I can help, uh, I can help move it along in a way that benefits the clients that do decide they want to build a data marketplace and do want to address the, the fact that they must understand how data is really oxygen for their company and then use that oxygen to live. Well put. Yeah. Well put. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming in and joining us here on our storytelling session. Um, Chris Geiger, Ideas Consultant for Sales here at uh, Podium Data just outside of Boston. Thanks for joining us. Maybe we can get a couple of Guinness systems over the table here now. Final question. Yeah. How many baseball caps do you own? I've never seen you in the same one place. Um, this is a hyper loop cap from uh, Elon Musk, got back to Peter Diamandis. I've also got a boring company hat. And if you, oh, the company that makes the flamethrowers. The flamethrowers. So actually, what he's really trying to do is pull a hole under Los Angeles from his house to his office. Interesting. And But anybody who saw the, the uh, Falcon Heavy launch, which brought chills to my spine, the Falcon Heavy launch, the most chilling thing is to see those two rocket boosters simultaneously, simultaneously land on a pod. <laughs> I know, think about it. Think about it like 50 years ago. They were lucky to just hit the ocean with the, with the fuselage after it had burned Oh out. my God. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Come back, come back again anytime.